Welcome to Mount Prospect Toastmasters, the friendliest club in the Northwest suburbs. Back in 1954, some pretty amazing things happened. The four minute mile record was broken, and also the five minute mile was broken in the same month by a woman. So they both achieved that record in the same month of May 1954. And another illustrious thing that happened in May of 1954 was the founding of Mount Prospect Toastmasters, the Friday's Club, as I mentioned before. <laughs> and it's been around for now 65 years. It, that makes it one of the oldest clubs in District 30. So we have a lot of interesting things to talk about tonight. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome up to the front the president of Mount Prospect Toastmasters, Bob Roman. Thank you, Mr. Sergeant at Arms, fellow Toastmasters, and most welcome guests. We have a special program for you. I think you are going to love it. So I'm glad that everyone is here. So I have the distinct honor of introducing not only our Toastmaster, but he got his start in Toastmasters. So in effect, with Jerry Evans, blame us because we got him involved and we stuck him with that Toastmaster virus. <laughs> he has it bad. <laughs> there isn't a contest that he has been the Toastmaster. He's probably been the Toastmaster more times than he's visited his clients, I bet you. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and Sarah was talking about her husband sells used cars. Now, that's, I was trying to say, what does he remind me of? So let's introduce our Toastmaster of the evening, the used car salesman, Jerry Evans. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Bob. I've never been introduced as a used car salesman. You always think of those blue suede shoes, you know, car salesmen, that they never let you walk out of the dealership. You, everybody drives. Uh, there used to be a Chevrolet dealer, in fact, since you're talking about used car sales, it's called Long Chevrolet. They used to have, they were on, um, they were on Grand Avenue in Elmhurst, and they had over 2,000, 3,000 cars in a lot at any given time. It didn't matter if you had a zero credit rating, <laughs> or no credit rating at all, everybody drove. So you'd see these people, they'd just go in there and they, yeah, Bob, you got this car, drive it home. And next thing you know, they had a payment for the next 10 years. <laughs> but they drove home. <laughs> and eventually, of course, he, he went out of business. But we're not here to talk about used cars. <laughs> we're not here to talk about used cars this evening. But before we begin, though, if you have these devices, you know what they are. It's okay, however, if you want to tweet tonight, because I know, Stella, we were talking about this in the contest, and we're in the middle of contest season. If you tweet silently, it's okay, because we all say, shut off your phones. But if you want to tweet about the festivities, the event this evening, by all means, do so. By all means, do so. So I'll give you a moment just to silence those. And if you have not signed our guest register, would you please make sure that you do so? Because we want you to, we want to keep that in posterity. The last time we had our event, which was the 60th anniversary, we had over 80 people attend. We had a lot of past district leaders, and I'll talk a little bit about them this evening. But we're just so glad that you're able to join us this evening because we are a family, we are a community, and all of us belong to different clubs. So what I'd like to do it's just quickly, if we can just go around the room and turn to the, part, turn to the person next to you or to the right of you, left it, whichever, and say to them, I'm so glad you're here tonight to celebrate with us. If you would do that, please. I'm glad you're here to celebrate with us. I'm glad you're here to celebrate with us. And we are genuinely... <laughs> We are genuinely glad that you are here because I'm going to share some things with you this evening. You know, Glenn was referencing Mount Prospect Toastmasters, and 
when Bob was talking about my history with the club, I remember distinctly, and we'll talk about Dick a little bit later on, but I distinctly remember walking into this club for the first time, and I knew that even though I didn't know anything about Toastmasters, I knew that I was home. Because just the way that they welcomed me and greeted me, I felt, well, this is an environment that I can grow in, that I can improve in. And Sue was asking me before we started now, she goes, well, you know, didn't you have some speaking background? Weren't you speaking before you joined Toastmasters? I said, yes, but not like I'm speaking now. Because it took me a long time to realize that it was more than just getting up in front of a group of people and just talk, 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 talk. Because we all like to talk as Toastmasters. But I said to her, I said, Sue, I learned how to be more concise and more precise, even though there's a lot of you who know me. I still have a challenge with time. I'll admit to that. <laughs> I'll admit to that. Pardon me? We never use enough time? That's it. I'm always, <laughs> I'm always under time, Stella. <laughs> do the manuals. It stands for do the manuals. <laughs> Tony's already, Jerry, stop. So let me share this with you. Uh, Stella was so kind to send this to me. And I'm going to put the club in perspective. Because there are 13 clubs in the district that are older than 60 years. 13 clubs. We're at what, 117, 127 clubs? We are 120 plus. Okay, so 120 plus, or so 13 clubs in the district that are 60 years old. Or so let me give you a quick rundown, and then I'll let you know where Mount Prospect falls in terms of the number of years. Lake Zurich Toastmasters started in 1940. They're 79 years old. It's the oldest club in the district. Oh my wow. goodness. 79 years old. Niles Township is the second oldest club. They were formed in 1948. They're 71 years old. North Suburban Toastmasters was started also in 1948, different times, 71 years old. And Dick Storer, he joined Park Ridge Toastmasters in 1961, and Park Ridge Toastmasters was started in 1949, so Park Ridge Toastmasters is 70 years old. Arlington Heights, which Sue is a part of, Sherry is also a part of, Arlington Heights Toastmasters was started in 1952. They're 67 years old. Addison Elmhurst, this is the one that sort of surprised me because I didn't realize they'd been around that long and I've been to the club before. They were started in 1954, 65 years old. And Mount Prospect Toastmasters started in 1954, as Glenn said earlier, 65 years old. And also Displains Toastmasters, Marguerite O'Connor is a member of Mount, I mean, of Displains Toastmasters, also 65 years old. And Virginia, this name will sound familiar too. Daniel Wright Toastmasters up in Gurney. Uh, also 64 years old. DuPage County Toastmasters started 1956, 63 years old. Naperville Toastmasters, Hugh Dunbar, I think he's still a member, is he still a member of Naperville? I'm not sure if he's Or is he a member of Peace? Oh, I know he's part of Peace. <coughs> Peace and War. Yeah, I'm not no, sure. War if he's I don't know if he's done. War closed? Yeah. Did they? Okay. Yeah. Nobody wanted a war. Nobody wanted peace. They wanted peace. I know. Peace. They wanted peace, right. So Naperville Toastmasters, 63. Baxter Toastmasters, formed in 1957, 62 years old. And Crystal Lake Toastmasters, 1954, yes. also 61 years old. So wow. that's a lot of history in the district. We're Fox Valley. And for, I know Stella might know, I'm not quite sure off the top of my head, what the average Toastmaster Club, how long they sustain, but I would guesstimate uh -huh. probably less than five years. About 105. 105 years? <laughs> Collectively, you mean? Collectively. Just joking. Collectively, oh, yes. Okay. So let me introduce, for those of you that don't know some of our dignitaries in the room this evening, there are certainly our VIPs. First, I want to start with my dear friend. And she and I met many years ago. She's been involved in so many different district conferences, district events. She is super creative. And I have the opportunity, I'll share with you a little bit later on, someone that I met that knows Stella. And she was talking about, too, how creative Stella is. So Stella Lawrence, our district director, District 30 director. <laughs> and sitting at the middle table, right to the left of Tony back there, is the person that's responsible for these things called starting and building new clubs and supporting them. Our club growth director, Belinda Foods. And 
we have several other dignitaries in the room this evening. We have our very on, very own, on, 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 on <laughs> Northwest Division Director, Virginia Bosserman. And North Central Area Director, C15, Tina? C12. C12, okay, I was close. <laughs> Tina Luck. Okay, let's see. Do I have any other area Sarah. directors here? Sarah. Division directors here? Sarah. Sarah. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Our featured speaker this evening. Sarah Bryant, what area? Come on. N43. N43. Okay. <laughs> that's north. That's north. For those of you who don't, haven't figured out yeah. the acronyms yet, that's north 43. So, well. So, I have I missed anyone else? Okay. Bob Roman? I'm just oh, okay. Oh, okay, you're moving. I know, but Glenn was reminding me. So now that he's reminded me. <laughs> past, past district governor and president of Mount Prospect Toastmasters, 1984, 1985, 85, 86. 87, 88. 87, 88. Okay, I'm off three years. Pass this to Governor Bob Roman. And later on, I will introduce a special gentleman, which is going to be my honor and privilege to introduce him. And we'll get to that um, because he has really been a cornerstone of this district and probably the most seasoned postmaster in District 30 and any other surrounding districts. So, but we'll talk about him because he's a special guest of ours this evening. You, you know who that is on the agenda. So now we're going to move on to the next portion of the meeting, which will be our featured speaker this mm -hmm. evening. She and I started in Mount Prospect Toastmasters right about the same time, and I've seen her grow in so many different ways and take on so many different challenges, and it's really been a pleasure and a privilege to watch her because she has just evolved into just a super spectacular speaker. She's a wonderful coach. She's been a friend all these years. And tonight, we have the privilege and honor of listening to her and hearing a special speech this evening. The name of her speech is called Quiet Heroes. Club 1500 has been the launching place of many new Toastmasters, always a great and supportive environment. One of its once new Toastmasters has come to pay tribute and tell the story of how Club 1500 changed her life. Quiet heroes, please help me welcome Sarah Bryant. for one moment to say that Jerry and I have been great friends over the years, but earlier today I texted him to find out what time this event started, and he literally texted me back, who dis? <laughs> <laughs> and I looked back at my previous text, and I hadn't texted him since I think 2013, so it's freaking <laughs> <laughs> And he wouldn't tell me the answer. I literally had to say, it's Sarah, Sarah Bryan. He was like, oh, mm, 615. <laughs> he wasn't sure it was really me. <laughs> Feeling sick and scared, I came to my first Toastmaster meeting at Mount Prospect Club 1500 as a guest in June of 2008. And what I saw did not fit my expectations of Toastmasters at all. Now, I don't really know how my expectations got formed in the first place, having that be the first Toastmaster meeting I had ever been to, but I remember hearing about Toastmasters maybe all the way back to high school. And what I pictured was a sort of a fraternity, or something like maybe the Shriners or the Masons, but definitely an auditorium of very polished men, for some reason, in my head, and they would be wearing jackets and they would have an embroidered crest on their chest or something like that. The reason that I came to Toastmasters to begin with is that I had developed a phobia of public speaking. And it's important to know that I did not start out like that. 
I actually loved the spotlight. As a child in high school and college, I loved it. Just give me any opportunity to speak or dance or act or entertain, and I was there. But in 2003, something happened that made me absolutely dysfunctional about speaking and cemented this dysfunction so that by 2008, the thought of speaking did this to me. Coming up to a presentation for the weeks before, I would get literally physically sick. And every time I thought about the speech that I had to give, my stomach would drop out and I would have heart palpitations and terror. And this is before having to get in front of an audience. Then, when I stood up to the lectern, I would get lightheaded and tunnel vision and shortness of breath and dry mouth and everything was sweating. Like everything was sweating. I'm surprised I didn't slip off of the stage. My knees got weak and my legs wouldn't even hold me. And the worst symptom of having a fear of public speaking was that at the time that I needed my brain the most to remember every word of this carefully constructed speech, <coughs> I was betrayed because half of my brain would violently take over and start asking stupid questions like, well, now that you're standing in front of a bunch of people, if you do throw up on your shoes, do you think you'll stay to clean it up or do you oh. think you'll leave and never come back? <laughs> And those were thoughts that I would actually have. And so how would this develop overnight, you ask? I think what happened is that I got what Zig Ziglar calls baked in the squat. Anybody ever heard that story by Zig Ziglar? Yeah. So Zig Ziglar is a very famous speaker, and he had this childhood story that he loved where he would talk about being a kid, going to his neighbor's house, and the neighbor pulls the biscuits out of the oven, and they're like flat like a silver dollar. And he says, what happened to the biscuits? And the neighbor says, well, Zig, they were sort of squatting before they rise, and they waited so long in the squat, they got cooked in the squat. And that's what happened to me. So here's how it evolved. In 2003, I was working in a big corporation as a director level, and I got this big opportunity. They said, you're gonna get to present this pilot program in front of the whole executive management. And these people were like layers of management above me. So I thought, this is so cool. And it actually included the president and CEO at the time of Zurich Kemper Life would be there. And they had a monthly executive meeting. And I was going to get to go in January and give 10 minutes on this pilot program that was kind of a spotlight thing. And I was so excited, because remember, at this time, I have no fear of public speaking. And I think that. Fear and excitement are just sort of two sides of the same coin. So I did what I could to prepare. I did what most of us would do to prepare for a big event like this, which is to say that I totally procrastinated. <laughs> and the tension started to, to escalate as I was thinking, well, I still have time. I still have time. And I think if you love roller coasters, you can, you can imagine that the tension building is kind of like a roller coaster where you get this like sort of long, ch -ch, slow ch -ch, lift ch -ch, to the top ch -ch, of the roller coaster. And once you get to the top, you realize there is no escape. You are going down at terminal velocity. And the only thing that is going to save you is the fact that everyone who came before you lived through it. And therefore, you probably will live through it too. And then when the ride is done, the car brings you back to the station. And you jump out of your seat and you go, woohoo, let's do that again. And public speaking is like that. Because there's tension leading up to it. And then there's the ride. But then when you're done, there's like this euphoria and a little extra adrenaline, and you face your fears and you triumph over it, and it's a good lesson. And so this is what I was facing, and that's the pattern that I really wanted to, to emulate. But what if, in the midst of your panic, on the initial climb up, you get to the top of the roller coaster and suddenly they say, okay, you have no obligation to continue this ride. Go ahead and exit. And that's what happened to me. Because two nights before the presentation, I still don't have anything prepared. But I think, you know, 
it'll be okay, I can whip it up. But my tension is high, and I get a message saying, uh, actually, we're gonna bump you, if it's okay, to the February executive meeting, because we had a change in the agenda. I was like, yes, 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 that's perfect, perfect. Um, yes, I wrote back, I will take the February slot. And then I thought to myself, this is so fortuitous, I now have the time to do it right. And what I can do is I can prepare and I can take myself out of this boiling situation and I can get everything ready in advance. But not tonight. Because I'm tired from all the terror of going through this for the last, you know, 30 days. And so the roller coaster ride started again for the next 30 days. Pressure mounting, pressure mounting. And one day before the, the presentation, I looked at my day timer, because it was 2003, and we used to write everything down. <laughs> I have to tell, yeah, a little help with the hint. Um, and I looked at my day timer, and I, was, I didn't realize that my whole evening was booked, because I had a birthday party to go to. I go, oh my gosh, I really don't have time to prepare. Right at 5 o'clock as I was leaving work, I got another message. There's been a change of agenda. We're going to have to proceed to March. Thank God. I will never, ever let this happen again. <laughs> and as I planned for March, I realized that that relief was not a blessing. That was actually the enemy, because what I was doing was I was waiting too long. I was, I was getting cooked in the squat. I was never preparing, but always having this tension, and I was never getting to relieve it. And I never got the vindication, the triumph, and the message that it's okay, it worked out. For the third one, I would be a fool to prepare that time, right? Because, I mean, the odds would show you that I'd probably, you know, it's going to get canceled and I'm not going to have to do it. So I thought, well, go ahead and get, get panicked, but don't prepare, because that would be a waste of time. <laughs> That's exactly what I did. And I got canceled again, and this went on. Eventually, the pilot ended. The company got sold. <laughs> <laughs> Me and all my friends moved to a bank in Elgin that they sold us to. And eventually we all got laid off. And none of that was as scary to me as that stupid presentation was. Now I face, a, you know, I'm, now, I'm, now I'm phobic. So knowing the strength of my fear and the intimidating expectations that I had about Toastmasters, I think you'll agree it was a miracle that I ever darkened the doorway of Club 1500 <laughs> June 2008. But I knew I needed to face the fast side of the roller coaster. So I stepped in, and what did I see? An outdated church basement, linoleum floor, folding chairs, and four of these five people. Dick Storer, Ken Uding, Jeff Chadwick, Bob Roman, and Bob Frazier. Now, if you don't know who those five guys are, <coughs> It's four grandpas and one young guy with the demeanor of a grandpa. <laughs> and they were so nice to me. And it was so chill and it was so relaxed. And they asked me about my goals and they asked me about myself. And then they put on a great organized meeting. I was scared the whole time. And at the end of it, they asked, how did you like it? And I did like it. But I didn't think I could do it. And they said, oh, you can do it. You can do it. And I didn't believe them. But I thought, if you have to conquer your fear, what better place than a church basement with like four strangers who are grandpas? Like, if you can't do this, you know, you better hang it up. So I was like, I'll take the opportunity and I'll do it. And it was shortly after that that Dick said to me, well, you gonna get up there? I think you'll be surprised. We're looking forward to your icebreaker. <gasps> you're, looking I, you're looking forward to my icebreaker? Well, I can't let you down. And I got up and I did my icebreaker. And I did not die. <laughs> but certain organ systems did shut down. <laughs> I mean, I had tremors, and I was feeling sick, and my heart exploded. And I do not remember 
anything about what I saw or what I said. And it was over. Huh? And the old men said, that was good. Now, the trick is to put your second speech real close after your first one. <laughs> and I said, okay. And I started to believe that this would work. And the gentlemen that were there that night, they kept this club running. And they were sweet and harmless. And I had no idea that these were prominent dignitaries in the Toastmaster world. Most of them were uh, past uh, district governors at that time. And, and Dick, uh, past uh, international director. If I had known I was walking into Toastmaster royalty, I never would have come here. <laughs> but the club and those people, they didn't stand on accolades. They didn't even talk about them. I didn't find that out until years later. They put this club together to create a structure for new people to come in and learn how to be leaders, learn how to communicate better, learn how to thrive, and learn how to face the fast side of the roller coaster. And it worked for me. It took me just three speeches to regain my faculties, which was my goal. I just wanted to regain the use of my body during a speech. And it took three speeches. But I'm still here today. I was a, a officer of Mount Prospect Club. I was a mentor to clubs. And I was this year the area director for a club up, up in the North Division. And I keep coming because I keep learning new things. But it's because I was supported and I was encouraged. Uh, because it was such a supportive environment, I kept taking new, new leaps of faith. Even at times then, I didn't feel that I had it in me. I could look to the people who were showing the way. Tonight, I'm probably giving about my 100th speech here to honor this club and the heroes who kept it alive all those years ago. So that at least one new Toastmaster, speaking for myself, could become a better leader and a competent communicator. And especially to Dick Storer, who has achieved greatly, but who isn't great because of his accomplishments. He is great because of his kindness. Thank you, Dick. Mr. Yeah. Toastmaster. <laughs> Two more P's. Okay. Panic. Uh -huh. Or procrastinate, right? Absolutely. I love, that. Your list. I love that. None of us ever procrastinate giving a speech, do you? <laughs> you never post funny, you never put it up. <clears throat> You're always ready. You don't have to get ready. Yes? Mm -hmm. no? Okay, sure. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. When Sarah and I met and similar experience, because Sarah actually came to Mount Prospect a month before I did. She came in June 2008, and then I followed shortly thereafter in July of 2008, <coughs> except Mount Prospect got a twofer, because my son, <coughs> Kevin, said, Dad, I got this really cool thing we could do together. Now, you'd have to know my son, Kevin, usually more like, let's go skydiving, let's go bungee jumping, let's go whitewater rafting, something adventurous, he says, no, there's this group called Toastmasters. I had heard the name, but like most of you, I wasn't really sure what they did. And he and I walked into Mount Prospect Toastmasters the last week of June of 2008. And much similar, as, as Sarah mentioned, greeted by these gentlemen. And very warm, inviting, welcoming. No, no put on no airs, no whatever. And as I said earlier, you felt this is a very comfortable, safe, supported place, and they made you feel just like a guest in your home. And then, just like Sierra, her arm was twisted, not. <laughs> Two weeks after walking to Mount Prospect Toastmasters, my son Kevin and I became members of Mount Prospect Toastmasters, and I want to save it a little bit later on, but that was because of those five gentlemen that Sarah mentioned that we wanted to come back because we realized that this was the place where we could develop our speaking skills and our leadership skills 
And at that time, between the five of them, they had 150 years of Toastmastering experience. 150 years. <coughs> about that. So Sarah and I both, just like a lot of you are members currently, we had the privilege of meeting these five individuals to get us started on that road, that path to becoming better communicators and better leaders. So now let's switch gears. She's going to be our extemporaneous educator this evening, or our table topics master, and she's going to lead us in some fun and frivolity. I'm not quite sure what she has planned, but Sherry will certainly make it entertaining, interesting. So please help me welcome our holiday topics master for this evening, Sherry Gewald. Well, I don't know if I can live up to those expectations. <laughs> okay, 1954, Dwight D. Eisenhower was president. Yes. The average cost of a house was $10,250. We pay more for a car now. <laughs> The average cost of a new car, seventeen hundred, and a movie ticket was seventy cents. What a wow. deal! Right? Oh, wow. Okay. Two of the popular films in 1954 were White Christmas and The Glenn Miller Story. Oh. What is your favorite movie of all time? Um, let's see, Glenn. All right. Thank you, Madam Table Topics Master, fellow Toastmasters and guests. My favorite movie of all time, that is a really good one. I've got a lot of favorites. We just recently saw one which is called Yesterday, which is a great movie. If you haven't seen it, it's about this guy is in an automobile accident and he wakes up and nobody's heard of the Beatles except him. Oh my God. And he was a struggling musician and he sort of took advantage of that situation and, and it was kind of interesting what happened after that. So that was a great movie, but if I had to pick my favorite of all time, I would have to pick, and this probably wouldn't choose this as your own, but it's Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. <laughs> it has a lot of stuff in it. Yep. It has a really cool car. Uh, there's a train in it that has my initials on it. <laughs> Which stands for Great Western Railroad, but when I saw that when I was a kid, I'm like, wow, my initials are in a movie. So that was pretty awesome. And it has lots of candy, which I like. Mm -hmm. And um, it had a good theme to it. It had music, and it was just an all-around all fun and entertaining movie. So I'd have to say Chitty Chitty Bang Bang was my favorite movie. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you. I'd like to tell you that whenever I've done table topics before, I would stand off to the side a little bit. But Jerry informed me that I should get off the stage <laughs> and take a seat. So that's just what I did tonight. I'm following his expert advice. So as not to compete with the person who was talking up here. So I think that's a step in the right direction. There were many exciting products introduced in 1954. M&M peanuts, the milk chocolate that melts in your mouth and not in your hand. RCA Victor color television. <laughs> the first nonstick pan. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Bye-bye white appliances because now we have colored appliances. <laughs> and Dow Chemical created Saran wrap. <laughs> what product of those could you not live without today? I'll review the M&M peanuts, color TV, nonstick pan, 
colored kitchen appliances in saran wrap. I know there's one of these that you could not live without. Virginia! <laughs> <laughs> saran wrap because I ran out of saran wrap before I moved two years ago and I still look in the cupboard for it and it's still not there so clearly I can do that. I don't have colored appliances and neither did my mother so I can do without that. I'm going to go with color TV. I love the fact that with technology now they can take the black and white movies and colorize them because I think that that just brings so much more life to the movie when you can see the colors and the background and the scenery and it's not just all gray. So I'm going to go with bringing color to life and color TV would be what I would pick from that list. stand opened in Miami. Burgers and shakes were 18 cents oh. each. Wow. <laughs> wow. Tony, what's your favorite fast food restaurant? No, I'm doing Tony. You are? Yes. Oh, that's a good excuse. <laughs> Choose one of our guests. <laughs> one of our guests, okay. I was having a conversation with Alan. Alan. Whoa. Yes. Fast food place. I'm not much of a fast food guy. Um, more of a stay at home and cook. But Ooh. if I did had to pick a favorite fast food, in college I did used to go to Chick fil A a lot. Oh. <laughs> when I did run out of the um, ingredients to cook with, or if I was uh, on, on, if I was trying to grab something uh, to go quick, uh, I would stop by Chick fil A because it was on campus and close by. So. Chick-fil-A, favorite fast food. All right. Well, thanks for stepping up. And the last one is, the popular TV shows in 1954 were I Love Lucy, The Jackie Gleason Show, and Dragnet. And I watched all of them. Bob Roman. <laughs> How do you think the Jackie Gleason show would be received today? Oh, they oh. <laughs> Well, one thing I found out being in Toastmasters that Jackie Gleason always came out on the stage with a cigarette in one hand and a drink in the other. <laughs> and one time they asked Jackie Gleason why he did that. And his answer was, you don't think I'm going out there alone, do you? <laughs> he, he was afraid of public speaking. And that's what he used that crutch. And uh, when he did his stand-up comedy, but I 
I watch TV what, what my dad wanted to watch. Yeah. And because there were only four channels, uh, two, seven, nine, and 11, that was it. Four channels. Once in a while, then they went to UHF, UHF. and then you would be able to get other channels, but mostly it was on those networks on a two, five, seven, Nine. And nine, but but that was like an independent station. If you watch the Cubs, it was on nine, but the other stations were the networks. And they used to sign off at midnight and, and not sign back on until like four or five in the morning after that. But Jackie Gleason always watched his variety show, but I really loved the Honeymoon. Mm -hmm. yes. That was one of the classic shows. So if you ever get an opportunity to watch that, that is uh, <coughs> terrific comedy. He always says, "Where are you? I'm, you're going to go to the moon, Alice. Yeah. We're going to go to the moon." <coughs> but he never did anything like that. He always threatened it. He found out he was just a big baby, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then he had his his friend Norton. Uh, Ralph was a bus driver, and he always tried to uppity up his position, and his friend uh, made more money, but he made it in the sewer, <laughs> sewers of New York. So it was a good show. Oh, and then they smoked and, dra and drank on TV. So it wasn't like today where no cigarettes, no nothing. We had it all at that time, and we thought it was the end of the world. And the same thing, I remember my dad brought the first color TV, and it was a detective show, and it showed a, a lady that she got killed in a pool of blood. And that blood was so red, but then we said, hey, even the commercials are in color. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I am told we have time for one more, so here goes. Elvis Presley began his music career in 1954, and John Travolta was born in that year. When you were a teenager, did you have a crush on somebody famous? And then he... Oh. From the band from the UK had come out, it was called Wham and George Michael and Andrew Ridgely. So all the girls used to just sing their song, and it was a big thing those days. And uh, like Wake Me Up and all those songs. So we were just glued to our TV watching their songs and the videos. And so I, I had a huge crush on George Michael, you know, with his good looks and you know, big fan following. <coughs> Little did I know that he was gay, you know, those things. <laughs> so, so when the news, when I came to know that he was gay, I, I was, uh, my heart was uh, really broken. And then when he died a few years ago, I was just regretting, you know, his sad story. But uh, yeah, George Michael is uh, someone who had one of my first crushes. And he, he was very good looking and a good voice and one girl's over. So um, I still remembered him and his music. and. I think he made a lot of impact all over the world, you know, with his music, and he's still cherished today. And, and now, uh, I think a movie is coming, Last Christmas, Christmas is going to be released in December, I heard, and it's based on his songs, and I think uh, some songs will be used, some of his songs will be used there. So I'm looking forward to see that movie too. Uh, but his music really soothed me and inspired me, and still does to this day. Oh, Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sherry. 
I told you, didn't she make that fun and entertain you? <laughs> got a flashback to the past. You know, Bob was talking about the honeymooners, and those of you who have never had an opportunity to watch it, Norton was actually Bob. I love Norton. Hey, Ralph! Norton! Norton! <laughs> Ralphie boy. Yeah, Ralphie boy. Yeah, you don't, you don't see sitcoms like that much anymore. And it kind of takes you back because some of the messages in the episodes were just so simplistic, but yet the message really was very profound because some of the lessons of, you know, today they go, oh man, that was hokey. That was just like... What, what? and Grace and... Uh, and What's that? All the, the, com these, the comedies you mean? Okay. Yeah, they were just the, the messages, but it was, it was, it was excellent shows. And, and I, too, had a crush on George Michael. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll admit it. I'll admit it. Because I love Wake Me Up Before You Go-Go. That's right. I love this song. Because Virginia knows. I played that song. Yeah. It just puts you in a great mood, puts you in a happy mood. Of course, then some of you know that when we do contests and stuff, I love to play Happy by Pharrell Williams. That's by far. And it's one of the most, they just had a thing the other day talking about some of these songs through the decades, since we are going to go into a new decade. And Pharrell, that was one of the top songs, like one of the top 10 songs over the past 10 years. So, along with a bunch of others, I don't really shop. So now we're going to shift gears again. Are you ready to laugh? Yes. 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 You ready to be even more entertained? Yes. yes. Well, you're, get ready. Get ready, because this gentleman here, I met him quite a few years ago. He and I uh, had an opportunity to work together and starting and building clubs with demo meetings and other opportunities. And he's a comedian. He's also a master of ceremonies. And he's a speaker. And we talk about old school. Well, he is funny, and he's old school. And sometimes he actually looks and he sounds like a comic. But on the serious side, he actually helps people overcome their fears, anxieties, the sweaty palms that Sarah talked about when giving presentations. He also shows people how to feel comfortable on stage and interact with the audience. He can demonstrate how to create an exciting and engaging learning environment where people are interested and they want to know more. He can also teach you how to create and deliver presentations that sets you apart from the crowd. Would we all like to do that? Absolutely. And, of course, one of his strengths, really, is how to make people laugh and feel good while sharing tips and ideas for more effective training, also to sharpen participants' communication skills when he's conducting a presentation. Also provide insight on how to, and why, how to take risk. We all, as Toastmasters, we have to take risk all the time. And the other part that what he does is he trains trainers to use humor and laughter, as you will soon see, to connect to an audience. These are some comments that Robert has received from audiences. He's performed and hosted over 300 shows. He's played at places like Zany's. Everybody heard of Zany's? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right? The Laugh Factory? Yes. Cubby Bear? Yes. This was when this one was new to me. The Comedy Shrine? Yes. Gorilla, Gorilla Tango Theater? Comedy Sports, he's also been on The View, Stage 773, The Vic Theater, and now, for the first time, the First United Methodist Church. <laughs> so let's make some noise, fellow Toastmasters and guests. There ain't no finer than Mr. Robert Kleiner. <laughs> Welcome Toastmasters, welcome everyone, and thank you for coming to the 65th anniversary of Mount Prospect Toastmasters. Thank you. You know, I actually believe, I was reading this online, so it's got to be true, Dick Storr founded this club, and I think Bob Roman joined the next year, and you brought Donna Weston with you the next year, and maybe Jerry, right? It was online, it's got to be true, right? <laughs> But thank you, Jerry, for that great introduction. I really appreciate it. You know, I want to sit down and hear the words I'm going to say. You know, that was awesome. <laughs> it really was nice, and a very nice introduction. You know, it sure beats my first introduction. The first time I was introduced to a group of people, it sounded like this. Rob Kleiner, clean up on aisle five, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but just a few quick housekeeping rules here tonight. Please, don't tell anyone that... You know why we're here tonight. Dick Store thinks he's here to fix the Victrola, so you know. <laughs> Some of you may have to Google that and see what I'm talking about. 
But uh, also, just to remind you, I am on Ambien, so I am not responsible for anything I say or do here tonight. You know, that's number one. But my name is Rob Kleiner. I'm also known as the subservient comic, because I'll do anything for stage time. I mean anything, you know? You know what I mean, Bob? I don't know why this grinder app all of a sudden went off, but that's something else. <laughs> but, you know, yes, I'll do anything for stage time. Just like Toastmasters, you'll do anything for a pin, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? But like Jerry said, I have performed in actually 355 shows. Now, I've actually entertained three of them, so I think we're due for a good night here tonight, right? But also, i got to tell you, this is the very first time I've performed in a Methodist church, because I'm Episcopalian. But, no, nine years of doing comedy, and this is the highlight of my career, performing in a church basement, you know? I mean, where do I go from here? It's done, it's over, there's nothing left, you know? I mean, prior to this, I think my, my best paying gig was uh, emceeing Adam Goldberg's bar mitzvah, so, you know, I don't know how I can top it. But this is great, you know, I notice some of you are looking at me and wondering, is Rob wearing Spanx? No, 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 I'm not. All right, all right, we'll get that, you know, out of the way. But also, I got to tell you, I was a little late in coming here tonight because I'm actually from Chicago, East Rogers Park neighborhood. And then I had to stop at the uh, dry cleaners and get my wrestling tights and then take the kids to social media rehab, you know. You know how it is, Bob, right? You know? But coming from East Rogers Park is like the melting pot of the inner city. I mean, you got your gangbangers, drug dealers, hookers, and that's just in my family. <laughs> but it's exciting to be here tonight. I'm really excited to be here, you know. I feel like I'm a, a teenager on spring break. You know? No, really. Who am I kidding? The last time I was on a date, Elvis was touring Hawaii, you know? <laughs> but you guys have been around for 65 years, which is pretty amazing. That's really amazing, you know? Because so much things have happened since 65 years ago. Like, times have really changed. Because I remember, when I was a teenager, my mother gave me $2, and she'd send me to the store. By the time I came back, I had two loaves of Wonder Bread, a couple of quarts of milk, a box of laundry detergent, oh, some apples, oranges, bananas, a pack of razzles, a gold sack of gold nugget bubble gum, a roll of, uh, what do you call, bottle caps candy, a salami, a copy of Mad Magazine, of course an issue of TV Guide, a pack of marbles, a new pair of blue jeans, a new pair of white tube socks, and a new pair of gym shoes. But you can't get that today, you just can't. They got those damn video cameras in the ceiling, you know, you just can't do it. And I don't look good in orange, I just can't have that. But you know, you guys may or may not know that I am married, you know, in fact, I've been married for, well, here, this is my GPS locator, you can see it. Right? But this represents 25 years of marriage, 25 years. No, you don't have to applaud, please. But I gotta tell you, after 25 years, my wife is still hot. It just comes in flashes. But, and I thank God she's still good looking because she's a terrible, terrible, terrible cook. Yes, very terrible. In fact, for uh, Christmas, I'm gonna buy her a stove that flushes. But I can wait. <laughs> but also, um, no, really, thank you everyone for coming out here tonight to celebrate Mount Prospect Toastmasters. I love Toastmasters. I am, in fact, the Toastmasters, and I can see there's a lot of DTMs around the room, and I remember when I earned my DTM, I was so excited. Oh, the ego on me, you know? I'd be walking down hallways like, I'm a DTM, I'm a DTM, out of my way, DTM coming, DTM. <laughs> Which I'd always tell people, DTM stands for... Don't talk to me, don't touch me, don't tease me, don't threaten me, don't teach me, don't trip me, don't talk to me, I said don't talk to me. But Toastmasters call, corporate called me one day and they says, Rob, we're going to go back to the original program we used to have. We're going to give you a DCTM, which stands for don't come to our meetings. But, <laughs> But you guys are part of the greatest organization in the world. Toastmaster is, and I, you should give yourself a round of applause for being here. Uh, Toastmaster is great. 
because you're here to work on your communication skills because public speaking is the greatest fear that people have. You know, my personal greatest fear is getting the results back from the paternity test, but that's, you know, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I have two boys and I love them, I really do. Because after all, there's a 99.9% .9 chance they're mine. But some of you will get that on the way home, you know? <laughs> but anyway, again, thank you for being here. But like I said, there's so much in Toastmasters that I've, I've learned, like big few things. It's like how to position yourself on stage, how to use vocal variety. And of course, the most important thing is how to incorporate occasionally that uh, rude gesture that you know you feel like telling your audience, right? You know, just sometimes you got to do it. Hey, come on, you know, here, 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 you know, <laughs> hey, what's this? You know, come on. It goes a long way. People, gestures go big or go home. But also, <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> you know you're having a good show when you got to thank every person individually. I <laughs> But also, I want to say that contest, who doesn't love the contest? I love the contest. I remember one year I was in the finals of the Table Topics Contest. And the question was, if you had one wish, what would you wish for? Now, one gentleman says, oh, I wish for world peace. Another lady came on and says, oh, I wish I could feed all the hungry people in the world. You know, and I said, I wish I had a new Escalade, you know, so <laughs> I, I, I didn't win. But it was a great experience, and I love Toastmasters, and I thank him for that. But actually, I got to tell you, <coughs> as I mentioned, nine years doing comedy now, nine years. And, which is ironic, because that's how long it took me to finish high school. But <laughs> do you see that correlation somewhere? <laughs> you know? But I got to tell you, I finally did it. I earned the PhD. Thanks for the applause. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, no, I was a PhD in comedy because I am poor, hungry, and desperate. <laughs> um, but I actually, I do stand up comedy, and I'm also in real estate sales. So that means I have two low paying jobs, you know? <laughs> All right, we'll edit that out when we go live. <laughs> but yes, I do comedy. I work in real estate. I drive for Uber and Lyft. I deliver pizzas. I work as a busboy. I clean carpets for Stanley Steamer. And I teach English as a second language. But next week, I have the biggest interview of my life. And if I land that job, my career is going to catapult. Folks, let me tell you, it's working at Baskin Robbins, and I gotta tell you, you know, you can't beat them. 31 flavors? Come on, that's the pinnacle of my career. But I can't work all these jobs anymore because I'm getting old, and, it, and it, it's hard getting older, you know? And back in the 80s, I remember it was carefree and fun. I was a DJ, and we were jamming to YMCA, right? Well, today I'm getting old. I'm jamming to AARP, you know? <laughs> I just can't. But I tell you, I, I love it, you know, I love music from that era. It's the best decade for music. In fact, like, how many of you went to see Cher last week? She was in town. Come on, Cher? Girlfriend? Come on, Cher? You know, people always think, Rob, are you gay? You, you know, because you're neat and thin and you like Cher? I'm not gay. I'm not gay. My two fathers are. But, oh, but Cher is great. I mean, you know, oh, it was an awesome concert. All right, I'll tell you the truth. Who am I kidding? The last concert I went to see was the robot band at Chuck E. Cheese's. You know, that's, that's where I was. But I tell you, I love that big bear, you know. Ba-boom, 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 ba-boom. You know, he's playing, and then I'm dancing to the bear. Oh, I love it, you know. Doing a little this thing going on, you know, you know a little spin. Oh, <laughs> Jerry, I shouldn't have done that. I think I broke something. <laughs> but it, it was a great show. But anyway, in conclusion, to sum up here, you guys are a great, great crowd. I really appreciate it. I got to head out because I'm almost out of time and jokes.
and sanity. <laughs> but it's been a pleasure being here for you. It really has. It's a different pace, you know, because I'm used to playing for people that drink like they're in a Penn State fraternity. So it's a totally different atmosphere. But if you guys like any of my jokes, please let me know so I can notify the temp agency. And I think I'm going to take a break, hang out in the back, do a little vaping. If, ladies, if you want to come by and say hello, I'll hug you like Joe Biden. But, oh, oh, you'll be calling it tomorrow. Don't worry. Um, but one last thing, you know, you know, is there a doctor in the house? Because I don't think Dick's store can take much more of this, you know? <laughs> but I do thank you, everyone. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And congratulations on all your successes. Thank you. All right. stand-up comedy. <laughs> you know, when we think about the humorous speech contest, I remember, because I want to call up Dick in a moment, I remember Dick coming up to me and saying, Jerry, we have these things called contests. I'm like, okay, Dick, what kind of contest do we have? Well, we have four different kinds of contests every year. Okay, what kind of contest do we have? So he starts rallying them off. He goes, but six weeks from now, he goes, we're going to have this humorous speech contest. Uh-huh. And he goes, you could be in it. And I said, all right, Dick, what do I have to do? He goes, no problem, Jerry. You just have to be funny for five to seven minutes. <laughs> and being the, per the persuasive powers that he had, six weeks later, guess where I was at? <laughs> I, was in a, I was in a humorous speech contest, so I was fortunate that I actually wound up, I was shocked as anyone, I wound up winning the club, oh. and he said, now you have to go to Libertyville. How many of you have been in a contest where you go, oh my God, I win, now I have to practice, and I have to go on to the next level, right, whether it's area division or whatever it may be. So I found myself at Liberty Moto, and Bob used to be a member of a club called Twice as Nice, and Joe Butkowski, and what was his wife's name, Bob? Anyway, so there was this couple, they were the Butkowskis. So his wife was competing. So any of you who ever happened to back, you know, back then went up to, it was a club called Liberty Moto. And it was up in Libertyville right off of uh, 45. So I walk into this place and there was this huge auditorium where their CEO would give presentations. And it must have seated about 250 people. Big stage, lights, had a sound booth, everything. And then I see this guy's wife, and I see these other experienced Toastmasters, and here I'm like, Dick, what did you get me into? <laughs> and he was there, as supportive as ever. He says, Jerry, you'll have fun, enjoy it, you'll be just fine. And I still remember the speech that I gave to this day. And he said, you'll learn from the experience, you'll grow from the experience, and he says, you will live, to, to Sarah said, you will live to speak again. <laughs> and so I blame it on Dick for getting me involved in a contest. And that hasn't stopped since then. So now we're at the stage where I want to bring up this gentleman. But first let me tell you a little bit about it. I told you in the beginning where Sarah, she told you her story about how she joined Mount Prospect Toastmasters. And when I walked into Mount Prospect Toastmasters the last week of June of 2008, I had the privilege of meeting Dick. He was the first person that greeted me when I actually walked in the club. And I remember succinctly when my son Kevin and I walked in, and we walked in, and he says, oh, welcome. He says, welcome to Mount Prospect Toastmasters. And as soon as he walked up to me, he says, hi, I'm Dick Storer. Who are you? And I introduced myself. I introduced my son. <coughs> and he says, well, welcome to Mount Prospect. He says, what brought you here? And I told him, you know, why we came here. I said, my son Kevin convinced me to come here and see what Toastmasters was all about. And I said, Oh, nice to meet you, Dick. I said, how long have you been a Toastmaster? At that point in time, Dick had been a Toastmaster for 50 years. Oh. And I said, Dick, how does anyone stay in Toastmasters or any organization that long? And with a real serious look, he just looked at me, just kind of like, is that a question? <laughs> and he goes, it's simple. I'm a slow learner. <laughs> and he just said it's so deadpan and so serious. I thought, 50 years? <laughs> and you're just a slow learner. And Sarah mentioned Ken Uding. 
and Bob Frazier and Bob and the other Toastmasters, and we, you know, I quickly learned that, oh my God, this is 150 years of Toastmastering here. I'm pretty sure I can learn a lot from, from these folks, and it hasn't stopped then. And I was privileged that he was my first mentor. He is still my mentor to this day. He and I get together every so often for lunch and just to chat about life in general, about Toastmasters. And I so appreciate him because had it not been for him and encouraging me and Kevin <coughs> to stay in Toastmasters, 11 years later, it's hard for me to believe I wouldn't be standing here this evening. And that's because of Dick Storr. So I'd like Dick to come up and say a few words to, to all of you because he was instrumental, as Sarah explained earlier. Had it not been for Dick and these other gentlemen, Mount Prospect Toastmasters probably would not still be in existence because they had the determination, the dedication, and the commitment when, as Sarah mentioned, the club was at a very low tide with only a handful of members. And then later on, when she and I joined and Kevin joined, we finally got up to, I think, what, only eight or nine? And then, you know, years going forward, we started adding additional members. But Dick was the spark because he used to hand out the Spark Plug Award. We used to hand, oh, that, at, oh we used to hand that out at every meeting. And it was... Talking because Dick because started of Dick. Talking. Dick started, yeah, Dick started a lot of different clubs. And I'll have Dick share the story with you, but he, he and I were chatting about how he found Mount Prospect Toastmasters, how he found the venue, but I'll let Dick explain that. So please help me welcome up my dear friend and mentor, Mr. <coughs> Dick Storm. a few years and uh, <clears throat> tell you what I view of Mount Prospect Toastmasters. It was mentioned about uh, Ken Uting several times here this evening and to tell you the truth, I, I was sort of hoping maybe Ken might have uh, taken the hint. I, I dropped a note to him and suggested that he might want to come here, but uh, I guess he couldn't make it. <clears throat> but uh, back in, in the the olden days, if you pardon the expression, Mount Prospect was the top club. They were good, and other people knew it too. So <clears throat> I, I had uh, I known Ken for a number of years at the time, and uh, a number of the other members of the uh, Mount Prospect club, and they were certainly, if you had a pick, let's say out of uh, roughly 200 Toastmaster clubs, if you had to pick probably maybe the four or five top clubs, Mount well, Prospect would have been them. They were a good club and everybody else knew it too. However, time can do funny things to you. <clears throat> One day I was, I don't know where, what meeting I was attending, but somewhere, I don't know if I was listening to a <coughs> <clears throat> international director at the time, or what the heck it was, or, or who told me, but they said that Mount Prospect is going down the tubes. They, they had a vote by all of their members, and I don't know how many old was, all, but probably not more than four or five or so, <clears throat> but they had a vote that they should throw in their sponge and throw in the um, charter. charter and then disband Toastmasters. And I, I couldn't believe what I heard. Like I say, I had known Ken and a number of the other members over the years, and uh, <clears throat> for this group, this top group, to throw in their charter. I said, you can't take a 50-year-old club. Now, at that time, they were maybe either just a year or two <coughs> short of 50 or perhaps a year or two over 50, but just rounding it off, I said, you can't take a 50-year <coughs> club and throw in the charter. It just can't be done. Well, <clears throat> they finally changed their mind and then told the world headquarters that they weren't disbanding. They wanted to keep their charter, <clears throat> and they sent in their dues for four people, four people. That was the whole Mount Prospect Toastmaster Club. Now, 
And you're thinking four people, that's one, two, three, four. Well, two of those four <coughs> paid their dues just to help keep the charter alive, <coughs> but with absolutely no intent to come to a meeting. Oh, hmm. wow. No intent to come to a meeting, just being good guys and saying, here's my check for another six months. So what we have, we had a Toastmaster club with two people. That's not a lot. I guess that gives you the speaker and the evaluator. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when I heard that, I thought, you know, to take a top drawer club, <clears throat> even though they're stumbling and having some difficulties, you, you can't take the charter away from them. <clears throat> so I said, I'm going to come, come over and, and talk to them, and uh, we're going to see what we're going to do to get this club alive. Well, we didn't have a, a place to meet because when we decided to throw in the charter, we went, uh, met at a church, not this church, but at another church in Mount Prospect. <clears throat> and uh, we, we canceled all, or I say we, they, what was left of the club. They threw, they decided that we didn't need the church anymore, so we didn't have a meeting place. Well, somewhere, probably within the next month or so, I'm not sure how long it took, but they did find a, a uh, meeting place in a bank. Now, it was in a little, small, I'm going to call it a storage room, about what a met, uh, amount or two. And we had a table that we sat around. It was a little more than a card table, about a card table and a half. It was big enough for one person on the left side to sit there, and another member on the other side, the end, and the one around the corner. And then at the far side, <clears throat> that was where the uh, then speaker or participator, whatever they were doing, be it speaking, evaluating, table topics, or what have you, that was at the other side. So that was room for four people. We had room to pick up for uh, two more checks. <laughs> so that's what we did. And we were on our way to revamping the club. <clears throat> and uh, like I say, with four people meeting every couple of weeks, uh, it wasn't much of a meeting, but we had the interest and uh, get up and go to make some officers out of ourselves and to Oh, I don't know what all we did do, but uh, again, the four of us were sitting around the table. A couple of new members that we had scrounged, besides the two that promised to come back. And that went on for a short while, and we finally picked up a few new members along the way, and come the next semi-annual period, I don't know how many we had, <clears throat> but I would guess perhaps seven, eight, I don't know, somewhere around there. But we were moving. <clears throat> and it was interesting. Uh, I, I had found a, one fellow that worked, he lived up in the northern suburbs, and he worked, I believe it was, I can't, I can't even think of what, maybe, maybe it was, I'm not sure, it's one of the southern suburbs. He would travel a better share of an hour going north from his home to go to work, and another hour coming home, so he's on the road for two hours for an eight-hour job. <clears throat> and he agreed that he would peel off at Mount Prospect and come in and sit down at our little four-way table there and, and uh, help me out. And, and we did a pretty good job. I say it took a while. But I believe that uh, we finally outgrew that meeting place in a hurry. It did have a couch in the rear that didn't, didn't fit the uh, table with the four people sitting around it. <clears throat> but uh, there were, it was sort of handy to tell our guests that you got to sit in the couch in the, in the back of the room. <laughs> but uh, that's what we did. <clears throat> and then, I say, well, by the time we get up to probably, you know, let's say, eight members, something like that, seven or eight, 
we decided we needed a happy home because this bank just didn't have it. So what we did was we <clears throat> conned myself into finding a happy home, and I agreed to do so. And I went out one Saturday, <clears throat> and I started to drive around the neighborhood. And my own club, Park Ridge, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, met in a church, so I was familiar with churches and Toastmaster clubs and so forth. So I thought that sounds like a good thing. So I went to a few non-churches, non but mostly I was looking at the churches. And some wanted too much money, some didn't have any room. Uh, they, they all seemed to have excuses, or at least uh, they weren't for us. And I thought, well, let's, let's throw in the sponge and forget the whole thing. And what I'll do is turn around and go back home and have lunch and we'll think about it uh, this afternoon. So anyway, <coughs> uh, <coughs> I did turn around. I was headed home uh, for lunch. And I came across another church. And I thought, again, you know, I don't know how I missed this one, but uh, here's another church. Let's try it. That's the same church that you're sitting in right now. Oh, my goodness. And we, there was a lady that was working there. I don't know if she was a secretary or what her job was, but she showed me around. And I explained what we do. We meet every couple of weeks and so on. And uh, <clears throat> she did a fine job of selling me. But I said, you know, I sort of like what I see. But uh, I'm going to have to ask our members, and because we're going to have to raise our dues, I'm sure, uh, in order to, to pay for it. And she hadn't even told me a price yet. However, I had a price in my mind, which is a price that we were paying for Park, the church at Park Ridge. And I might say at the time, we had a good, very good bargain at Park Ridge. <clears throat> but I thought, well, I'll use that as a, as a limit, you know. And then we would still have to raise our dues. And she thought for a minute and says, uh, how about such and such? Uh, would that be too much? <laughs> I couldn't believe it. It was less than we were paying at Park Ridge. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, I, I don't know. I, I can't speak for the club. But uh, I, I think I can <clears throat> bring it back to the club and explain it to them and tell them that we were going to have to raise our dues and so on. And, well, she said, well, why don't you do that? And I thought, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's that's going to be easy to do, very easy. And we, we did just that. And we ended up here. And they've been so easy to work with and so nice to provide for us. I guess we couldn't ask for any more. And over the years, <clears throat> I, I never intended to stay very long. <clears throat> I just joined them because uh, I didn't think a 50-year club should be washed down the toilet there. But uh, <clears throat> as a result, uh, I was enjoying the people we were bringing in. And I think at one time, I might be wrong, but I think we got up to 30 members. But uh, things were, I see a head nodding, so I, I know we got up to 30 members. But uh, <clears throat> it was very enjoyable, and uh, I just kept coming back and coming back. And mm -hmm. next thing you know, uh, Mark uh, Parker, not Parker, but the Mel Prospect is what it is today. And I think it's doing a pretty fine job. If you look around, see what we have. We even brought in a couple of guests that are uh, thinking seriously, I think, of joining. And I would highly recommend that they do. Uh, I, I've enjoyed working with weak clubs and helping them build up, but I've never had quite as much fun and enjoyment as I have here. Mr. Chair. Uh -huh. attrition with clubs, but not prospect over the years, just like every club has an ebb and flow. 
the core members have always been an integral part mm -hmm. of this club. It's like when I met Bob Roman and when Dick was referring to, <coughs> excuse me, Ken Uding, who now lives in Texas, he was here last year. He actually came into Chicago because he was here for the international convention. And he would, you know, stay in touch. And then when I saw him, it was just like, you know, he had never left. It was just that kind of friendly relationship with him. And he was talking about, you know, when he was part of the club, because at that point, I think, Ken Uding, he had been with Toastmaster for 28 years. And Bob at that time was probably 30 years. So again, 30, 28. And I don't know if you all picked, that up, picked up on that or not, but Dick will be celebrating. You ready for this? 59 years as a Toastmaster. I was, thinking, I was thinking about that today, Dick, and I wanted to call T.I. because, you know, Stella provided me the list of the clubs that were over 60 years old, but I wanted to call T.I. and find out worldwide, you know, how many Toastmasters we have that have that kind of seniority, that kind of tenure with Toastmasters. Because... You know, the average Toastmaster today doesn't quite stay <laughs> that long, do they, Diane? No, they don't. No, no, they don't. So before we take a break for, for uh, all the sweet treats, I would like to have Diane come up because what we're going to do... Do you want to do last call for tickets while they're having dessert? One. And then we'll recall okay. the call the Tickets winners. again. Dollar per ticket or you get six for five, which increases your chances. Now is the last call for that before we start drawing tickets. So anybody want to rush over there now and give Diane some, some money? Come on, this is your opportunity. Anybody feeling lucky today? <laughs> no? Before okay. Di does that, I want to acknowledge some of our guests this evening. Because I didn't do that in the beginning. So I do want to acknowledge them. Because Alan, Alan, would you please stand up, please? Alan, this is his first time at a Toastmasters meeting, and he decided to come tonight, and he saw, you know, we were celebrating the 65th anniversary, and he saw about Dick, so he came here to join us and help celebrate, so, Alan, thank you for coming. Okay. And he did table Yes, and he did table topics. Because, as he said, you know, we just take for granted, people know all these acronyms and, you know, what the, what the designations mean, and, you know, like, we didn't, we didn't have any idea in the beginning what that meant either. And also, and I, I, I apologize, let them know, she used to be with XL Toastmas, let them know what your name is again. Oh, Angel. 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 So she was a member of XL Toastmas, so she also came this evening to help us celebrate 65th anniversary and Dick's door and us. Stand up. Alec is a member of XL Toastmasters. He's a newer Toastmaster member. So he also came this evening to help us celebrate 65th and Dick Store Night. So I'll thank you for joining us. <laughs> and one of our cherished members, because I haven't seen this gentleman in quite some time, and I was so thrilled to see him this evening. So, Ron, would you please stand up and introduce oh. yourself? <laughs> I've been with uh, Mont Prospect since 2013. Uh, over the last uh, probably a year, I uh, haven't been as regular as, uh, and I, I should be out here in this club, but uh, I'm inspired by stories uh, that, that Dick has, uh, you know, was, was uh, telling us before. And I also met, uh, you, you talked about Jeff Chadwick. Yes. I ran into Jeff and I work at Walgreens, so oh. we were talking about some of those same stories back in the Yeah, Jeff, Jeff, unfortunately, he couldn't be here this evening, yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to be participating uh, and, and be part of the 65th uh, annual training. So glad you came, Ron. Thank you. <laughs> so Sarah and I were talking about when we first came here back in 2008, Jeff Chadwick, who works for Walgreens, he was the other individual who was kind of the core foundation of the group because he had joined and he was also helping too. You know, I could, I could describe Dick as a rejuvenator, revivinator, resuscitator, because they were all helping us do that. Because, you know, anyone, any of you who've been in a club where they're really struggling, low membership club, you know how difficult it is. Hamani was a coach for a club for two years, trying to get them to distinguish, right, Hamani? Yeah. She worked her butt off for two solid years, 
And it wasn't through any, you know, it wasn't because of the lack of her efforts on her part, but she's invested two years in trying to get that club back up to snuff. And sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. Fortunate for Mount Prospect, it did. But that's the kind of dedication and commitment to our Toastmaster members that they really put into, you know, keeping these clubs alive, especially when they're a very seasoned Toastmaster club. So are we ready, Don? Well, actually, okay. for the next couple of minutes, I'd okay. like to ask Mr. Roman if he would be so kind as to serve his delicious cheesecake. Okay. We have cheesecake. We also have sheet cake. Jen, can I put you to work? Sure. Would you be willing to okay. cut and serve the sure. cake? And give me a couple of minutes, and then we'll start pulling prizes. Okay. okay. Not the best part of the night, but I'm going to ask you to be our, um, our picker. Okay, as oh, our start yeah. for the raffle prizes. Oh, you just sit there, okay. we'll bring them to you. <laughs> oh, okay. bring them to you. Yeah, yeah. Get some dessert, get some sweet, yeah. and we'll do this in a minute. Okay. I hope I so while we're waiting for them to cut the cake, the cheesecake, and there's also, you notice that yeah, Bob, since he's, you get, you get free cheesecake tonight, but there's a sign over there on the table where it's a silent auction, Bob will bake you a cheesecake of your choosing. Is that correct, Bob? Yes. Um. So he'll, he'll bake whatever. Alan, thank you. Please come back and join us again. I will. I'll be here next year. You guys will be here on uh, Christmas, right? No. Yep. Okay. Next year. All right. Next year. All right. All right. Thanks so much. Right. He'll bake you a cheesecake of, of your choosing. So please come back and visit Mount Prospect when they have a regular meeting. They won't be serving all this food, though. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I'm sure. We won't have all these raffle prizes and stuff like that. Also because Bob and I and Virginia and uh, Tim, we belong to Toastmaster on Purpose and Glenn also. And we invite you, if you're still in a festive holiday party mood, tomorrow night, Toastmaster on Purpose, we're having our annual holiday party at Harper College. It's in Building X Room, X143. I know that Glenn and Bob, they've distributed the flyer, but if you're so inclined, we'd love to have you come and join us tomorrow night just to continue the party and the festivities. Okay. Because we'll be playing music and we'll have videos. And actually, our club, we have a fireplace. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. It's virtual, but we have a fireplace. Uh huh. <laughs> somebody came last year. Somebody came last year and they go, Jerry, is that your fireplace? <laughs> and I said, Yeah, because you know how you can on, on, on DVR or whatever. And during this time of year, you can put up a virtual fireplace. Yeah. So I just turned that on, and it's, it's really awesome. So are they done? They're ready. Why don't you go ahead and get your dessert? Yeah, get your dessert, and then we'll, we'll draw. Cheesecake. Fellow Toastmasters, one thing that was not said during all the presentations was that the next 65 years of the Mount Prospect Toastmasters are even going to be greater than the first 65 years. Oh, that's true. And I will close out the meeting on that. So good night, everyone. Have a safe trip home. Please take food. If you want food, take all you can eat. All you can take. 